What a resplendent day to worship the Lord in Ypsilanti and welcome this morning to First Presbyterian Church as we gather today in the beautiful day. So first let me wish you the peace of Christ be with you. Also with you. We welcome you all and those who are online to please say hello to Phyllis who will respond to your wonderful notes and we do read them during the week. Let me begin with this wonderful word that the steadfast love and faithfulness will meet. Righteousness and peace will kiss. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and live according to it, that we may grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. So trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins this morning together. God of grace, love, and communion, we confess that we have failed to love you with all our heart, soul, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. We ignore your commandments, stray from your way, and follow other gods. Have mercy on us. Forgive our sins and raise us to a new life that we may serve you faithfully and give honor to your holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, through Christ, God has poured out on us the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins. So, friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. 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 
Please join me in our prayer for illumination. For holy, holy, holy one, guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory and honor and praise in your threefold name, through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. The first reading this morning is from Psalm 24. I'll see the entire Psalm. I'll read the parts in regular print if you would join our voices together in the parts of bold, bold parts, so we read it responsively. So I say unto you, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. Such is the company of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. The reading from this morning continues in Mark's chapter, the sixth chapter. It's an interlude as Mark loves to give. We search one textual story in the midst of another. We've had stories of Jesus calming the water when there was chaos as the disciples were fearful in the boat. We've heard stories of Jesus bringing a daughter who was dead back to life and restoring her to the leader of the synagogue, her father, and the community. The healing of a woman who'd been hemorrhaging for 12 years and these miracles these signs of the work of God, the people press in on Jesus again and again. And here we have at the end of the sixth chapter a story that is not about healing. It is about illness in the world. It is a story about men of power and their own self-glorification. In the midst of this came John the Baptist. In order to read today's story, we have to know the prologue. Mark sets out at the beginning, and I'll read it, at the very beginning, all that we need to know about the gospel. In 13 verses, he tells us the entire gospel, and he says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? He says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. So he connects us back to the ancient prophets. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan And just as Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. So fast forward a few years and many events, and we come to the sixth chapter, set for today, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard of it, that is, he heard of all the healings about Jesus and the power of Jesus. For Jesus' name had become known, and some were saying, 
John the baptizer has been raised for the dead, has been raised from the dead. And for this reason, these powers are at work in Jesus. But others said it is Elijah, and others said it's a prophet like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised? So the prologue is set. Herod Antipas, he's the son of the original king. He's a stooge of Rome. He had three brothers. When the father died, the kingdom was divided into quarters, so he's called a tetrarch, meaning one-fourth. He leads one-fourth of the country, but he yearns to be king of it all. And now he's having a flashback. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. But Herod had married her. So he marries, he divorces his first wife, which causes a conflict which later leads to problems, which was an alliance of power. He divorces her and takes his brother's wife as his own and gets a stepdaughter, we'll hear about in a moment. You see, you don't need to watch Jerry Springer to get a little entertainment, just read the Bible. <laughs> so, his brother is Philip's wife because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful to have your brother's wife. And Herodias, who's the new wife, had a grudge against John and wanted to kill John, but she could not. For Herod feared John knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and so he protected him. When he heard John, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced... She pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, and note, when he says girl, that word really means she's about 12 to 14. She's the age of the girl who was raised by Jesus. So a 12-year-old comes in and entertains a party full of drunken men. It's in the text. Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask of me, I will give even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? And the mother replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately, the girl rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. She adds that little bit. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oaths and for his guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When the disciples heard about it, they came and took the body of John and laid it in a tomb. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's a tough text. comes in the middle of all these wonderful healings, and we're going to turn from that text to another banquet next week of Jesus feeding the 5,000 on a hillside. So note the contrast. John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, emerged from the wilderness with a message of repentance for all. With fearless speech, he confronted the elite of his day with a solid rebuke of their unlawful conduct. John the Baptist... Baptist realizes, though, that his bold speaking out against the king's unlawful arrangement could cost him everything, including the loss of his life. John's behavior in Mark's prologue, which I felt I had to read you today, gives us insight into what prepared John to act so boldly in what we just read. In the prologue, John is portrayed as being independent of the finer things in life, he has a modest amount of the world's goods in form of his diet and apparel. His simple lifestyle equips him to speak prophetically to those in power because he is not beholden to them for either prestige or his well-being. We must give special attention to how Mark begins the gospel in order to understand the entirety of his gospel. I see Mark's preaching to power as a cinematic drama. 
It's like a movie that must be seen from the start for the viewer to have a meaningful understanding of each of its parts. At the beginning, we get all these hints and clues of what to look for and what to pay special attention to throughout the movie. Without the beginning, it's very hard to follow the storyline all the way to the end. At the beginning of Mark's drama, he tells us in 13 verses what he wants us to know. Mark's prologue is so packed that it could actually stand independently from the rest of the gospel and still carry in short form the full freight of what he's trying to tell us. One is coming with special power, who is God's anointed, the Holy One, and he too will speak to you in forgiveness, not repentance, and give you the power of the Holy Spirit. And then, as Eugene Peterson says in his translation, you will be changed from the inside out. In it, we see the pronounced details about John the Baptist's forerunning ministry. John is portrayed as a servant of God who has a burning passion to serve. In today's reading, we see John carrying out his call to bear witness to truth no matter the cost. The prologue tells us of John's fearless character. He spent time alone with God in the wilderness. We too might feel the need, and we should, to spend time alone with God in the wilderness. In the unplanned wilderness, God strips us of our dependence upon order and structure. In the unpredictable wilderness, we encounter the formless silence that pulls at divided hearts away from deadly distractions in our highly advanced world. In the wilderness, God weans us from our dependence on order and settled routine and can finally speak to our hearts. Contrast Herodias, Herod Antipas' new wife of convenience, who loved her way of life so much she is willing to kill an innocent man to protect and preserve it. She wanted John dead. His preaching exposed the illegitimacy of Herod's rule over the Jews. He who wanted to be king of Judea, king of the Jews as it were, was no king at all. Herod prevented John's immediate death, but to satisfy Herodias, he had John arrested and imprisoned. Herodias, an expert at keeping a grudge alive, nursed a grudge, the text tells us, against John. Even though Herod's political system prevented him from immediately destroying John without reason, Herodias' hatred and rage for John grew stronger each day. Herodias was being shrewd and stealthy, delaying her gratification for a day she could act. Act out her revenge against John for the painful truth he blatantly spoke against injustice about her relationship with the king and the people. Herodias didn't seem to get mad about John's actions. She got organized. She cleverly waited until Herod's political system afforded an opportunity for her to carry out her evil plot against her targeted enemy. Herodias' actions reveal how the powerful often control political systems and manipulate them to reward their allies and punish and destroy their perceived enemies and opponents. It's nothing new here, brothers and sisters. Herodias patiently concealed her plan of attack until Herod threw a birthday party for himself, inviting all the high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee together. Then a nameless female's outstanding performance pleased the men and won her the privilege to ask for anything she wanted from Herod, up to half his kingdom. Though this young lady won this right through her performance in a scandalous environment, filled with military leaders and others. You know, you need to know, women in her day were not allowed at these parties, and they were certainly never allowed to speak in public. And yet here she is, perhaps due to age, allowed in, perhaps due to age, taken advantage of even. But she entertains them and she wins the award. But she did not know how to exercise the privilege extended to her. Do you get that? She didn't know what to ask for. Though she'd been given a token of power, she had not been properly educated in knowing how to use it. What benefit is it to give a slave physical freedom while intentionally holding her or him to remain sla enslaved, unrestored? 
What good is it to give the slave the freedom to ask for whatever she wants without first educating her about what valuable things she could ask for? The failure of that system in this regard left the young female dancer, who is his stepdaughter and niece, vulnerable to be filled with negative and destructive information that had been given to her from any source. So she turned to the only source she knew who could help her figure out what to ask for. She consulted with her mother. And she asked her mother, what shall I ask for? Her mother had no loving advice or wise counsel to give her. The only thing Herodias had to give her daughter was a well-nursed grudge. She made her daughter an accomplice in her plan to attack against John. Herodias advised her daughter to ask for the head of John the Baptist. The king's offer enabled Herodias to use the king's policy to kill John. Herodias' daughter, an obedient child, followed her mother's evil counsel. She called for the death of an innocent man because of her mother's desires. You know, it is sad to see, and I'm sure you've seen it in life, that some parents' approval for their children is based upon their children's willingness to hate the people and groups their parents and grandparents tell them to hate. This generational transmission of hatred has been the bloody legacy left to too many children by their parents and grandparents. Too often, this infamous legacy of hand-me-down hatred has caused the death of many innocent people who happen to be members of racial or religious or political groups around the world and through history. They're earmarked as threats to unjust political arrangements because that's what they've been taught. What gifts do we hand on to our children? Herod became aware that his political system was being manipulated. He knew it by a grudge to kill an innocent man. Still, he refused to change his course of action. He also will not upset the arrangement of power that he lives in to do the right thing. Clearly a failure of nerve on his part. For against the protest of good reason and holiness, he gives the order to the executioner, behead John the Baptist and bring it to me on a platter as she has asked. Herod made this ungodly decision out of his need to impress his political base assembled at the palace. He wanted his constituents to know that he was a politician who kept his word, even if it meant the destruction of an innocent life. He did not want to be accused of waffling or being indecisive. So the executioner carries out Herod's orders, kind of like Abu Ghraib. He didn't question his superiors, but like Herodias' daughters, did what he was told. He knew if he had questioned the orders of the king, he would have had his own head taken. He probably felt it was better that someone else's head be cut off instead of his own. He probably felt justified by knowing that he was following orders so he could excuse himself. How often in history have we seen evil atrocities carried out by evil regimes, all because people unthinkingly follow unjust orders or cannot bring themselves to stand up? before the tank on the square. Today's text appears to end on a sad note to those unfamiliar with Mark's prologue. John the Baptist's head is delivered on a platter as requested by a daughter. Mark tells that when the disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. And so ends the reading. But Jesus' disciples are now forced to look at him. They have heard about what happened, and they responded with care, moving towards the tragedy. They laid the body of John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, in a tomb. In so doing, they began to understand that this tragic act marked the end of John's ministry, but it did not mark the end of truth. Those of us who read the prologue understand that John had served his purpose. His calling has now been accomplished. He has successfully fulfilled his mission to prepare the way of the Lord, and it foreshadows what will happen to the Master. Now the disciples begin to look beyond the herald to Jesus and give their attention to the Lord of life. Herod fears that Jesus, as John returned from the dead, to challenge him again. 
Instead, he is now confronted by the legitimate king of the Jews. If only Herod had read the prologue, had seen the signs, would he have repented? Would he too bow down to the Lord of the dance and receive mercy? If Herod had known Mark's beginning, he would have known that Jesus' ministry was a ministry of repentance. That's for John. But Jesus' ministry is a ministry of conversion, that we would be changed from the inside out. If Herod only knew what we know from reading Mark's beginning, he would have understood that John the Baptist was only a precursor to the real world known as Christ. If Herod had known Mark's prologue, he would have known that John the Baptist said in Mark 1-7, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Or as Eugene Peterson puts it, I'm a mere stagehand to the act that follows. If Herod had known Mark's beginning, he would have known, I have baptized with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. If Herod had known Mark's prologue, he would have known that John was a messenger, but Jesus is the message. He would have known that the prophets of God may face a very bitter end, but there is no end to the truth that they proclaim. Herod would have known that the state's ultimate weapon of mass control, which is death, could not prevent the triumphant march of God's will in the world. Herod would have known that the servants of God already know that when they speak the truth about unlawful arrangements, the empire will strike back. But God's servants also know that though kings may cut off the heads of prophets, kings do not have the power to cut off the voice of truth. Truth is relentless and unyielding. Empires that once despised and raped truth in the public square have now fallen in humiliating collapse at the feet of truth. Though public opinion is often intolerant of truth, truth still remains the greatest public defender Political empires have bruised the beautiful face of truth with ugly fists of deception, but truth's beauty is still captivating more than a million sunsets. It may appear that truth gets tired of standing, but she continues to stand up for what is right. We thank you, God, for the prophetic message you have given us in the silent wilderness of your awesome presence. Grant us the way of peace. As it is written, only when you do the Jesus truth in the Jesus way do you get the Jesus life. Amen. So let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
I stand before the table of grace and offer prayers for grace. For living in the light of Christ, let us pray for the church and those in need. All God's creation sing, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. God of new life, you renew us daily through your baptismal promises. Guide us in all we do, that your power may shine in our words and deeds. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for the earth, for the health of all bodies of water, particularly the wonderful great lakes we live beside, for all rivers and streams flowing through our, all our communities, particularly the Huron watershed, that in the clear, clean waters you have created for us to drink and use, we may you see your love for all your creatures. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. For all who live directly by the bounty of the earth, for those who sow seeds and raise livestock and catch fish, for people who are in processing plants and factories, for people pack and haul and sell fruits and vegetables and meat, bless them in their labor for the sake of all who depend on them for food. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. For all governments, particularly we pray for the United States in this election year, we pray for the candidates who run for president for Joe Biden and Donald Trump, to watch over them and protect them so that the will of your people may be known, that all may live safely with their neighbors. May we hear and act as people who love the gospel and therefore can pray for friend and enemy, for foe and protector, for city councils we pray for, for county commissioners, for mayors, for all who vote and count the votes to protect them and watch over them. May we have peace in our land, as indeed we do, but help us to move towards it actively, for otherwise, we know from the day's reading the frailty of vanity that leads to chaos. So help give us order, as indeed you have, Help us to live by it and within it, the boundaries of your law. Give wisdom to the people that we will choose leaders who will serve the needs of all. Protect them. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. For children throughout the world, for good schools and compassionate teachers and healthy homes, for clothing, food, and shelter enough that they can thrive and grow, for friends and neighbors and aunts and uncles, grandparents and parents, who watch well over little ones, that their joy in this world may be complete. Hear us, O oh God, for your mercy is great. For all people who are in distress, those who are hurting, those who worry, those who are sick, those in need of a friend, for all on the prayer list of this congregation, for all whose names are known only to you. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. So we pray in thanksgiving for the gifts given to this church of tithes and offerings and bequests that they would be used wisely and for the good of all in your church. We pray for steadfastness in our community to work for justice by listening and caring and being strong and to not have a failure of nerve when we draw near the truth. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We remember with gratitude the witness of the saints whom we remember for this coming week. Particularly, we lift up the name of Betsy Maxwell, taken into your loving hands, a child of God. Help us to honor their faith with our lives. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught his disciples to pray. 
our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debtors as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. You're all hoping to go outside and there's a nice strong breeze blowing. I see it. I know it. It's okay. So may the breeze uphold you. and May you feel the wind at your back. For we go nowhere by accident. Wherever we go, Christ is sending us. Wherever we are, God has put us there. For he has a purpose in our being there. And Christ who dwells in us has something he wants to do through us where we are right now. Go forth in the love of God, the grace of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the community of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.